Okay. Well, we had some technical problems. Uh, I don't know how much you could hear from my, our previous um, conversation, uh, Rupert and I. I was introducing basically Rupert, explaining that he had been uh, editor of uh, in the Economist, uh, chairman of the, the Economist Group, and deputy governor of the ba Bank of England. And now we have uh, la we are lucky enough to have him as the chairman of Hill in Venezuela. Uh, Rupert is going to talk about uh, a few, uh, give a, an overview of uh, what's happening uh, today in the world uh, with this coronavirus crisis. Then we're going to, mm. from a broader picture, he's going to uh, concentrate on the UK. And also uh, later on, we're going to talk about how small businesses uh, in the UK, specifically Venezuelan business online, can thrive in this, um, in this uh, very difficult environment. So we have a couple of questions, but if you have, uh, if you want to send more uh, questions, please send it us on Facebook, and we will uh, capture them on our screen. Okay, so I'll leave it to with uh, Rupert. All right, Let, let's try again, and I hope you can see us clearly. Uh, it's very hard to be sure about anything in today's world. Uh, we all know massive uncertainty in our day-to-day -day lives. When we look out at the wider world, it looks even more uncertain. The one thing we can say for sure is that this is a health tragedy, a medical tragedy, a personal tragedy for many people. It's a social uh, horror story, lots of people with uh, mental health problems and it's potentially an economic disaster. Uh, already we can see how many uh, businesses have closed down, how spending has slowed down in every country in the world. And perhaps the only bright spot we can highlight is that environmentally there may be some benefits that are coming out of this in the form of cleaner water, cleaner air and so on. But that is a small compensation for all the rest of the difficulties and challenges that we're facing. So I don't want to get in the game of trying to guess what will happen. Anybody who claims they know what will happen is lying, frankly, and nobody really knows. But what I can say are a few things that might be of use to you running small businesses in Britain and elsewhere and linked one way and another with Venezuela and the Venezuelan diaspora. And I should say at this point, as I say every time, I do apologize that I can't talk Spanish uh, and uh, communicate in your language. But I do add that I admire hugely all the Venezuelans who live in Britain, who I've met, and the many more who I haven't. Uh, your spirit and your cheerfulness and your determination are, for me, uh, a remarkable uh, example of uh, uh, human triumph of human of human uh, humanity so thank you for being so cheerful thank you for being so positive let me try and be a little positive as well the first thing you do if you are running a business today is see what options there are that have been made available by government action. And the governments around the world, but let's stick with Britain, uh, have taken completely unprecedented measures to try and cope with this uh, pandemic. So the more you understand about the different schemes that are available, uh, the more you might discover that you are eligible for one of them. Typically, a small business, a sole trader type operation, the only thing you might be able to qualify for is a, uh, uh, some sort of scheme for the self-employed. And there is a fairly elaborate scheme which, as it happens, has gone live today, actually paying out money. Uh, and there are also some very uh, small loans for small businesses that might be of interest. The problem with loans, as we can all appreciate, 
is that you take on a loan, you have to repay it eventually. But the terms on which you'd be taking it out are very favourable. So it's not it's worth having a look at those. And you'll get all that information on the government website. There are pages and pages of information and working your way through all of them would take a long time. But I think you can assume that only the things for the self-employed or small business loans are the categories you ought to spend time studying to see whether they covered your particular circumstances. Then you think of how you should be running a business in these sorts of conditions. And the first thing to recognise is that however difficult you are finding it, almost all your customers and suppliers will be finding it equally difficult. And the one thing everybody is trying to do is ensure that they get paid. The one thing they want to do is hold on to cash as uh, long as they possibly can. And those two uh, emotions, uh, two principles, run absolutely counter one to the other. Uh, if you are, uh, owe money to someone, you want to delay payment as long as you can because you may not have the cash to pay it, but anyway, you want to hold on to your cash. And if you are owed money by somebody, you want to collect it as quickly as possible. So there's an enormous tension between creditors and debtors at a time like this. And all you can do as a, a company who is uh, wanting to be paid properly is to insist on the best terms you can right at the beginning. If possible, operate a cash business where somebody can't buy something from you unless they've either paid by bank transfer or by credit card uh, straight up so that you know you've got the cash before you deliver whatever it may be, a food a, a supply or uh, crafts or whatever. Uh, so whatever you can do to conserve your cash, please do. That's the most important thing of all. The second thing you can do is look to see what kind of uh, delays you can uh, qualify for in making payments to the government or to the landlord who you've got a property rented from or something like that. There are various schemes of deferment. VAT, for example, if you go on the VAT website, you may well find that in certain circumstances you can delay paying your VAT for a period without penalty. So there are things like that which you should explore and take maximum advantage of. Then you go and think, well, how can I not just survive and conserve cash, but how can I actually take something uh, out of this crisis and turn it into an opportunity? And that obviously means getting your message out, getting your products, your services out to as wide a range of people as possible. Uh, to people who may already be your customers, trying to encourage them to buy more, but uh, mostly to uh, people who are potentially new customers. You will know that uh, the Buy Venezuelan Initiative, which the charity has launched, the Healing Venezuela charity has launched, is uh, an opportunity for small vendors in uh, the Venezuelan diaspora to market their products and services. And uh, through that uh, umbrella organization by Venezuelan, uh, they are doing some extra marketing, uh, digital marketing on various uh, social media channels like Facebook to uh, encourage as many people as possible to know about the existence of all of you but also to start uh, buying more from, from you. And a big diaspora like the Venezuelan diaspora can actually be very mutually supportive, making sure that when you order food, you are looking to see what Venezuelan options there are before you buy from somewhere else and that sort of thing. So there are various measures that you can take to promote yourself to customers um, 
and some of it is word of mouth, but a lot of it, of course, is going to be encouraging your friends, your contacts and your existing customers to share the information about you with as wide a group as possible. And I think a serious push to market what you're doing uh, is time well spent. Now I'm going to pause at that point uh, because I think there are some questions that have come through and that I need to follow up. Yes, uh, so before um, moving to questions, uh, uh, if you want again, if you want to make to ask questions, please add it on the comment section of the Facebook Live. Uh, for those of you who don't know what Buy Venezuelan is, Buy Venezuelan is a scheme that has been organized by Healing Venezuela uh, with a grant from the Big Issue uh, to encourage a small uh, or a big uh, uh, provider of goods and services, Venezuelans, uh, providers of goods and services in England specifically, to promote okay. their business in England. And this is um, the scheme works in a, in a way that uh, Healy Venezuela promotes through their website and through their events like this one or campaigns uh, or um, online digital campaigns. Uh, Healy Venezuela promotes the, um, all the goods and services that are associated to the Buy Venezuelan for in exchange for a fee of 50 pounds at the end of the first year of operations, which means basically we're launched next, uh, this March. So in one year's time, if you are okay and happy with what's happening, uh, then we will receive a donation of 50 pounds. Uh, we also would like to remark that by Venezuelan, um, through the by Venezuelan scheme, uh, we can create websites and we have created websites for these small artisans that are starting and then uh, in the UK, in, in England, and then sometimes don't have the possibility or don't know how to uh, create a, a website. So, and uh, this is, uh, you can see us, you can see what we have done on our uh, healingvenezuela.org website. So with this um, clarification, I would like to move to some of the questions that we had uh, that were sent to us. Oh, one is, um, for Rupert, why, how can a, a small online business thrive in this new environment? Well, it, it goes back mainly to what I was saying about uh, marketing. You know, the uh, key thing at the moment, obviously, controlling your costs uh, in the way that I described, seeing if you can uh, reduce the amount of rental you're paying on property, seeing if you can uh, delay paying uh, any tax uh, VAT that you might be uh, required to pay. Uh, but in general, just controlling costs as far as you possibly can. That's an obvious point. But the real challenge is going to be, and the real opportunity is going to be to find new markets or to sell more to existing markets. And it's surprising, I think you'll find, that the pattern of spending by people in these circumstances has changed dramatically. First of all, unfortunately, people are spending less uh, because they are very uncertain, because they don't have the opportunity. I mean, we have a car, we haven't put any petrol in it for weeks on end now. Uh, so that's an example of uh, how spending is just going down. But there are still things that people are doing online buying all sorts of things that they wouldn't necessarily have bought normally. And if you can make sure that your website or your link is prominent, uh, prominently displayed, then uh, you might uh, start to attract new, new uh, business. And that really is the, the big challenge uh, for you uh, over the next few weeks. Uh, and I hope uh, that there will be examples already of people who are managing to do this and have been pleasantly surprised by what you can, uh, what you can achieve. Um, yes, and I think that uh, you have noticed that you mentioned before that the spending for food has increased online because people cannot uh, go out and do the shopping, so they tend to buy a lot online, a lot of food online, is that correct? Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you look at the 
food delivery companies, whether they be the big ones uh, that are delivering on behalf of the big supermarket chains, whether that's Tesco or Waitrose or Cardo, uh, all of those are massively busy at the moment uh, because people are, frankly, uh, either unable to get out and f shop for food in the way they used to or they are scared to do so. So there's that uh, switch. But then there is an extra thing that's going on, which is a lot more takeaway food is being bought uh, in, uh, uh, the, in the country from small uh, suppliers, oftenly, often. Uh, local pubs, restaurants, uh, fast food chains may have one or two outlets open where you can order food and get it uh, delivered. The c delivery companies like Deliveroo and a whole lot more are very busy as well, but you can get food. If you're a food vendor, you can get your uh, supplies delivered to customers at a cost, obviously, but you pass that cost on to the customer who will well understand why they are paying more uh, to have stuff delivered to their house, and I don't think they will resent that at all. Okay, so uh, another question is, what should be the main focus of a small online retailer? There are so many hiccups at the moment. Some suppliers are closed, mindset of customers are different, etc. Yeah, and you know, the, the suppliers being closed is a real factor. Uh, I mean, I'd like to think that all your suppliers, if they were going to close or even curtail their operations, would tell you their customers before they were going to do that and would explain why and would give you some indication of when they might reopen in a normal way. But even if they do that, it doesn't stop the fact that your supply chain has been interrupted. And it's sometimes very difficult for you to carry on doing what you've been doing unless you've got the inputs from your suppliers. So again, if you've got uh, that happening to you, it's a matter of going out and looking for alternatives. Again, you know, we thank uh, goodness every day, a hundred times a day for the internet. Imagine what this would be like if we didn't have the kind of uh, internet access and the internet availability that we now have which is making all these sort of issues so much easier to resolve than they once would have been. There is a question about taxes. What do you think is going to happen uh, with taxes in the UK and in the world in general? How, the, the, how governments are going to finance these um, massive uh, aid packages? What's happening now is Every government everywhere in, uh, is going into huge deficit during this period. They recognize that these are extraordinary circumstances requiring extraordinary responses. And actually, the only part of an economy that can provide this kind of security and this kind of uh, support are governments because governments are going to be there tomorrow and next year and then the next decade and therefore they can borrow today uh, in the certainty that the people who've lent the money will be repaid sometime down the road. So part of what governments are doing at the moment is borrowing heavily and the question is when we start to get back to something like normality, uh, whatever that may be and it's certainly not necessarily the old normal, but it's certainly different from where we are now. The question for governments will be, what do they do about those deficits and the accumulated debts that they've incurred during this period? Well, the debts are there. They are going to be spread out over a large number of years, in some cases 50 years or more, and they will be, uh, if you like, uh, a charge on future generations. I hate to say this, but my children and grandchildren, and the same goes for you, will be paying the bills for this uh, pandemic for many, many years to come. So that's part of it, extra borrowing 
spread out and repaid over a long period. But on top of that, they are definitely, governments are definitely going to be looking at higher taxes. And the question they're going to be asking themselves is, how much do we charge in higher taxes and when do we start to introduce that into our, um, into our budgets? And the danger they will have is if they start too early and try and shrink their deficits too quickly after the end of this pandemic, whenever that occurs, they will be uh, simply driving the economies back into uh, recession. So they will be very careful, I hope, very careful in judging when they will start to take measures to either cut public expenditure or to uh, increase taxes. But they will be wanting to increase taxes, they will be wanting to cut expenditure. And I think you've got to recognise that quite a lot of uh, programmes that are at the moment uh, very f cherished by those who benefit from them are going to uh, be reduced or in one way or another changed. I draw attention particularly in this country uh, to the programmes that benefit pensioners. I have to say pensioners like me uh, who are uh, hugely uh, favoured by the tax system and by certain types of public expending. Public spe uh, spending. Uh, what's happening now with this lockdown is really in many ways for the benefit of the older, older people, 60 plus, 65 plus, it depends when you think you're getting old. But uh, it's at the expense of the old uh, it's for the benefit of the old at the expense of the young. And I do think that this is going to be something that governments are going to try and correct in their subsequent uh, behaviour. So I do think some of the uh, things that are particularly beneficial to the old, for example, uh, winter fuel allowances, things like that, free bus passes, these will either be abolished or they will be taxed as a benefit in a way that they're not at the moment. They will also have to keep spending a lot of money on the health service, so I think other categories of spending are going to come under very intense pressure. So one way or another, a combination of higher interest charges on much, much higher debt for many years to come, and some tax increases <coughs> and some spending cuts are going to be the way. But we need to be honest with ourselves. This is going to take a long time and the cost of this pandemic is going to be with us in one way or another for many years to come. This is not a short, nasty experience. This is something with long lasting consequences and scars that will be there for many, many years, decades to come. Thank you, Rupert. Um, in your experience, uh, in the 21st century, well, certainly not in the 21st century, but at least in the 20th century, can you, um, uh, can you remember, can you compare what's happening now worldwide with some uh, specific events? I mean, is this comparable to the Spanish flu, to the Depression, to the Second or First World War, to the 2008 crisis? How would you compare? what's happening now with events in the past and how we could learn from those lessons? Well, even I am not old enough to remember the Spanish flu, <laughs> but that was in 1918. Uh, but I mean, clearly that was far, far worse in terms of the lives lost to 25 million, 30 million, 50 million. You've seen estimates that range even higher than that for that. And that was partly because of medically people didn't know what was going on. The scientists were not as clued up as they are today. So we are very lucky that we have been able to avoid the worst health consequences that could have occurred with this virus if we hadn't had lockdown and quick uh, responses from many governments. But uh, in terms of the economic effect, of course, we don't know how long this is going to last and therefore we don't know just how serious the economic effect will be. But this is certainly up there with the Great Depression, which is the period from 1929 uh, through to 1939. 
1940, which was a period of very high unemployment in Western economies and throughout the world, of very slow growth, lots of protectionism, trade barriers being put up, which of course made the problems much worse. That was a period of shocking economic damage. And it was actually resolved only because of the war. Now, the war arose for a whole lot of reasons, some of them economic, but mainly not. But uh, they were uh, the, the economic consequences of the war was that the economies were put into full employment and high activity very quickly because of mobilization of troops, but also of uh, factories building armaments and so on. So it came to an end because of a lot of spending. But if you think in terms of the uh, lasting effects of the debt, uh, Britain came during the war, the Second World War, Britain as an example, ran government deficits which were as large as what we're going to be seeing here over these next uh, months and years, uh, and which, had, which were financed in the same way by debt which was stretched out over many decades afterwards. There were the loans that were um, made to the government during the war, which were called war loans. The last war loans were only uh, redeemed, uh, cancelled in this country about 10 years ago. So they continued for many decades after the war had ended. And that's going to be the same now. Okay, there is another question about interest rates. Should we expect um, interest rate to stay very low indefinitely now, uh, given the high government debt? What do you think? Well, the uh, intention of the government at the moment and uh, central banks here and in every country is to keep interest rates as low as possible uh, because of the need to finance uh, government debt at a very low interest rate, but also to make sure that those who are borrowing, and there are an awful lot of people who will be borrowing or who have outstanding debts, are not hit by higher interest charges as well. And that would put a lot of pressure on the banks if some of those debts turn sour. So there's a huge impetus at the moment to keep interest rates low. But it's worth remembering that interest rates can be kept low only at the short end, if you like, the short term interest rates, money borrowed for three months, six months, whatever. If you are borrowing for much longer, those long term interest rates are affected by a lot of things, including government and central bank action, but not only. So if actually there is a rise in the oil price way from where we are now, which is very low, to something like uh, double or triple where we are today. If other commodity prices were to start to rise, food prices, for example, were to start to rise, and therefore inflationary expectations began to creep in again, the long-term interest rates would start to rise anyway, irrespective of what the governments were trying to do. The moment there's no sign of that, and uh, frankly, I don't expect it, but when you ask, will they remain low indefinitely, I can't say that, no. But they will, in my view, re remain low for quite some time. Uh, thank you. Now, there is another question. Uh, do you advise to invest, in, to invest in properties this year? Would it help the local economy? Well, I hate to give you investment advice, but let me just talk a little bit about what property might or might not do. There's no doubt we've got a completely uh, clogged up housing market at the moment. Uh, so in terms of residential property, we've got a lot of unwinding to do of people who want to sell, people who want to buy, and quite a lot of transactions which had been agreed but then had to be put on hold for these last two months. They are now, as of this week, gradually being eased up and uh, people are allowed to go and visit houses again and look at houses. And there's no doubt there will be more activity in the housing market. Will this be at a higher or a lower price than before? In my view, it's almost certainly going to be at a lower price. A property that was worth uh, X today will be worth less. Uh, a property that was worth X three months ago will be worth less than X today and probably 
worth even less than that in uh, a month or two's time. That's as far as residential property is concerned and in the short term. If you take almost every other type of property, you get very mixed picture. I mean, who would want to be owning office blocks at the moment when you know that a lot of companies and organisations have discovered how easy it is to work from home and will not want as much office space as they have in the past. On the other hand, there are going to be uh, a lot of uh, organisations that are going to need storage areas, maybe because they're doing much more online shopping uh, and therefore they've got to be places where companies hold stocks, do their packaging, do their dispatch from there. So warehouses, I think, will be a very strong feature of the property market. But office blocks, shops, I don't see them being very strong, no. Okay, uh, there is another question. Would the government postpone uh, and or reconsider Brexit as a consequence of this huge debt that they are incurring with the pandemic? Well, so far, the government has been quite clear that it's not going to reconsider or postpone the deadline that it has imposed on itself. The deadline to leave uh, the uh, transition period at the end of this year. Brexit has happened in a legal sense. It happened at the end of last year. But there was a 12-month period after that, which was called the transition, which was intended to be the period when the government would negotiate a trade agreement with the EU. This uh, 12 months, of course, has been completely been preoccupied with the pandemic so far. And you could say that the chances of uh, reaching some sort of comprehensive trade agreement have been massively reduced, in fact, probably eliminated. One option the government can uh, exercise itself is to say, OK, we will postpone that end of the year deadline and to some date into the future, beyond the end of this year. If they're going to do that and request that, they've got to do it by the end of June. And so far, every time they've been asked this question, government ministers have said, no, we're not, we're sticking to this same deadline. So we've only got another uh, six weeks to go before we discover whether this is a bluff or whether it's what they really mean. I have no way of knowing. Uh, personally, if you ask my personal opinion, I devoutly hope they will be wise enough to postpone this uh, end of this transition until well into the future because negotiating a comprehensive trade agreement which is what we need will take a long time um, there is another question uh, do you think this crisis is gonna have an impact on the geopolitics it's gonna change the geo geopolitics uh, in the world compared for compared to what uh, we had before Hmm. I uh, am sure it's happening before our eyes. Uh, one of the things that's happening, uh, to my great sadness, and I'm sure to, uh, that's a view shared by quite a lot of you, is that the United States, which should be acting as the leader on a whole range of fronts, in terms of health initiatives, in terms of trade initiatives, in terms of financial support, uh, and uh, ensuring the world's financial system is secure. The United States just isn't there. It has a president who is not in any way engaged, doesn't probably even understand what I've just said. Uh, so I think the retreat of the United States from world leadership is visible day by day and growing. Uh, the question is, in this vacuum, what uh, fills, uh, what takes the place of the United States or at least shares the position? The obvious answer in normal circumstances would be China, which has been China's intention all along. But China has come out of this virus uh, pandemic so badly because of the way it behaved at the beginning that I think everybody is looking very suspiciously at Chinese motives, Chinese behaviour, and thinking, is this the country that we really want to take our lead from? 
So we have a very unhappy uh, uh, set of circumstances at the moment where China is pushing, the United States is withdrawing, but neither of them look remotely suited to the sort of role that this, is, that this uh, is, uh, circumstance needs. If you go back to the 1930s, to the Great Depression, you had a, in America a president coming in, Franklin Roosevelt, who was a man of enormous vision, enormous energy, and enormous courage. And he did all that was needed to give the world leadership, including, in the end, bringing the United States into the war and uh, therefore ensuring that Hitler and fascism were defeated. Um, there's nobody like that at the moment uh, in America, not in Congress, not in the Senate, and certainly not in the White House. It is very depressing. Yes, it's very depressing. So, well, we're uh, approaching the end of, uh, of this chat, Rupert, and one last question. Every crisis has uh, a silver lining. Uh, behind every crisis there is a uh, an opportunity. Which are the opportunities that you see for businesses, small, small businesses in particular, like the ones that are part of By Venezuelan? Uh, what do you think would be a good opportunity for, for people who want to start a business or people who are uh, already in business? Well, I think there is a greater appreciation and a, a respect for small businesses now than there was before. Uh, anybody who survives during this period and carries on and is making some money, enough to feed um, a family, pay the bills, deserves an enormous amount of respect. And I would like to think that small businesses will get a much better deal in terms of payment by their customers, not long delays in paying, uh, they will get a much better uh, deal from customers who will be keener to buy from small companies than they were before. So let's hope that this is one of the consequences that comes out, that the small business sector will be respected and admired and cherished for the value that it creates. Okay. Well, I think there are no more questions, uh, and so we can end this uh, conversation. Here we are. Uh, thank you very much for listening to us, for watching us. And if you want to receive more information about By Venezuelan, please contact us through our social media uh, or our email at info at healingvenezuela.co.uk. Thank you very much. Be safe and be healthy.